mind. What if you could turn your biggest fear into your greatest strength? In today's podcast, we're going to be talking to Josh Perry about how to audit your life and to optimise and leverage your fears. Hello and welcome to the Dawn Jarvis Show, where my goal is to inspire you with interviews from a diverse range of visionary leaders and entrepreneurs who share their entrepreneurial journey. Today, my very special guest is Josh Josh Perry. He is an optimization strategist. He helps individuals and organizations to optimize their performance, both personally and professionally. Josh's work, Purpose was born through his journey, battling multiple brain tumours throughout his professional BMX athletic career. Josh does unscalable things so organisations can scale. Hi, Josh. How are you doing? Hi, Don. I'm, I'm doing great. I appreciate you having me. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm really looking forward to our chat. Now, Josh and I met fairly recently. We were both on a a summit together and I got to know him a little bit um, after that. And But I would really love it if you could tell the audience a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, that was a great event that Kamalita had us uh, both at. Yes, that's right. We got got introduced before the summit on a little group Zoom, and then you and I spoke uh, privately after that. So uh, I always appreciate those opportunities to meet people like yourself. And um, yeah, I mean, that's that's been my life's journey. It's led me to where I am and who I've been able to connect with and who I've been able to serve, more importantly. And um, it started with me growing up playing school sports and along the way, skate parks and bikes at skate parks came into my life mm-hmm. when I was about 12 or 13. And then moving into high school, I chose a trade high school. I was starting to work for a friend of the family doing landscaping. And mm-hmm. I, I thought, what better way to uh, go through high school where I can uh, enter a program in my uh, uh, sophomore year where I can go to work for two weeks, earn money, get credit for my trade of choice, and then go to academics two weeks and just cycle on and off. And I saw that as a way to go to school less work more, make money and fuel my BMX endeavors and competing uh-huh. and traveling. And I managed all three of those very well. I turned professional my junior year. So my second to last year of high school, and um, it just started to take off. And then that's when I got an ultimatum from my boss one day to pick between, you know, his job he had for me or BMX because the seasons were peaked at the same time and the yeah. summer for landscaping. And then the summer was uh, the peak season for competitions. And so I, you know, being 17 at the time, I picked my dream and, mm-hmm. um, you know, I uh, dropped out of high school with the support of my parents and I moved from Northeast America down South to uh, North Carolina to train with like my heroes and idols. I watched growing up on TV and had posters of them on my wall and became friends with them and competitors and training partners and um, really just started living the dream on a level I never fathomed being possible. And then, yes. uh, you know, riding X games was a dream come true and things like that. And then it was my fourth year competing professional uh, or professionally when I had hit my head uh, and got a concussion. This was in March of 2010. Mm -hmm. And I had to get an MRI to make sure I didn't have a traumatic brain injury or anything like that. And um, Mm -hmm. a year or so prior, I was going in and out of the doctor's office, emergency care, urgent care, and all those things. And uh, complaining of these headaches, Mm -hmm. migraines, vision problems, and you, you name it. And, you know, being in America, paying for health insurance, I asked for some type of scan, you know, I didn't know which one x-ray cat scan MRI Mm -hmm. to look at my brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, the doctors kept telling me, you know, you're fine. You're you're young, you're in shape, you're, you're a professional athlete. There's nothing abnormal with your, you know, your blood work or any other checkups. Mm -hmm. You just have headaches. It's quite normal. Here's some pain pills. Come back if you need more. And that's what I did. And uh, never questioned them because I just thought, who am I? You know, I'm a civilian. They're the doctor. They know health better than I do. And so, you know, March 2010, where I hit my head, that led to an MRI that was deemed necessary to look Mm -hmm. for a traumatic brain injury. And then Mm -hmm. that's when they accidentally discovered the brain tumor I was living with unknowingly. So I like to say I didn't have a pain pill deficiency. I I had a a brain tumor. And if it wasn't Mm -hmm. for that crash and hit my head one day, I I believe I'd be dead. And um, Mm -hmm. that's what started my journey of really auditing my life and learning how to leverage all the things I wasn't doing to become a strength of mine and really, you know, take note of what I could have been doing to prevent it, or at least um, better my, my health and my performance. And so that's, 
that was the catalyst. And that led me through multiple diagnoses and surgeries and treatments um, and other injuries throughout my career. And then um, got me on purpose of helping other people with what I was going through and learning along the way. And I wanted to give back. And it was the third diagnosis in 2017 that helped me make sense of what I was going through. And I left my dream to pursue another dream. And here we are today. And I've been speaking for four years and coaching for five and um, haven't touched my bike in two and a half years. And I, oh, wow. uh, I love every second of it. Well, that is one hell of a story, actually. And, and you're young now. How old were you when you got your diagnosis? I had just turned 21 four months prior. Wow. So that is quite a devastating diagnosis to get at 21. And, and you, you talked about your headaches. So, um, so, so with my, my, my nurse training, so that would have been an indication, um, that, uh, there was something wrong and then, you know, so it had been growing for a while. And so when you got your diagnosis, did, did, were they talking about how long your life would be or what, what, what was happening that, and you know, that's a lot to deal with at 21. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, to paint a picture, I was 21. I was by myself. I thought I was just getting a routine checkup for hitting my head and going to be told Mm -hmm. two weeks off the bike and then you're okay to to get back to it. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I got the diagnosis, the, the first doctor that gave me the information, he said that, uh, you know, at this time, we don't know if it's benign or cancerous, but we do know it needs to be taken out immediately because of how uh, large it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and he warned me that I'd probably never ride my bike again. Mm-hmm. And uh, it'd be difficult getting back to daily things. And he just, you know, doing his job is let me know what the, you know, the potential road ahead was. And all I heard was cancer, never ride, going to ride your bike again, and you could die. Mm-hmm. And um, those were the thoughts that were cycling through my mind. And I just, you know, instantly my world was crushed. And I just kept thinking about how, I was going to die and I wasn't going to be able to continue living my dream that I worked so hard for. And I sacrificed everything for, and I was, you know, 13 hours away from my family living Mm -hmm. on my own, pursuing that dream. And, um, it all just kind of came crashing down in that moment. Well, um, you've shown amazing resilience and and strength to get through that. Not once, but but did you say your third tumor, you had it, this happened to you three times. So yeah, it was the, first diagnosis and surgery in 2010. And -hmm. then two years later, a routine MRI showed it had come back in two different areas. So we used a form of radiation called gamma knife radiotherapy to, uh, Mm -hmm. I like to say, just kind of zap them and they shrunk for a little while and then they stayed stable. And then in 2017, the third diagnosis showed two additional tumors on the other side of the brain. Wow! So I was living with four up until May of 2021. So just last year where I had a seizure Mm -hmm. in my sleep, that discovered a fifth brain tumor in my frontal oh my lobe, goodness. which made sense to the seizures. And then so mm-hmm. last August, so about nine months ago, I went through a weight craniotomy to remove the fifth tumor they discovered and all of the tumors. So for the first time in 13 plus years, depending on you know how long the original one was in yeah. there growing, um, I'm, yeah. I'm tumor free today. So um, yeah, there was, I don't know, five tumors, four different diagnoses, two surgeries and radiation and um, all the wow. challenges in between. <laughs> Yes, I'm going to say, and did you, and 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 I'm going to talk about your BMX career in a bit, but uh, well, I'm going to talk about it now, actually, I'm going to say, because did you go back to it in between these surgeries? Did you still, so I'm, I'm still getting my head around that you did it professionally. Um, and so, you know, you got paid to do that. So that's, that sounds fantastic. And in between those, those bouts of illness, did you, did you go back to it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. I competed an additional seven years after the first diagnosis. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I went through three separate diagnoses during my career. And then the mm-hmm. fourth one was last year. So it was, um, about a year and a half, two years. Yeah. About a year and a half after I stopped riding altogether. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I kept going back and that's, I mean, people say I'm crazy. And, um, I'm like, you know, that there's that saying, if you get by, uh, get bit by a shark in the water surfing, you're going to surf again. And it's like, people are like, no. And I'm like, I mean, I did, you know, I just, I loved it that much. And that uh-huh. was, you know, um, I learned after that, like, that's where a lot of my identity was wrapped around and I wasn't yes. aware of it, but like, yeah, I just, I just felt so inclined to do it. Cause that's who I thought I was and what I was supposed to do, but I also loved it. And so that's why I kept doing it for so many years after until, I became um, really aware of my shift in values and priorities in my life and decided it wasn't worth the risk anymore. And 
brain tumor or not, you know, I've hit my head um, multiple times mm -hmm. while throughout my career on top of that. And I, um, you know, I, I love what I do today and I didn't want to, you know, have any uh, disadvantages or um, any risk to what I do today to help other people is the, you know, the belief I've taken on that that's my calling in life to do and why I'm still here and able mm -hmm. to, to be having these conversations and be able yeah. to get out of bed on my own. Yeah. And share and share your story. So you gave up BMX and was there, was there a, did, did you have a like Dem road to Damascus moment? Did you say I'm, I'm giving it up today or was it a gradual sort of, yeah, my, my journey is going to be different from, from now on, or was that a gradual thing, sudden thing? How did that happen? So the feeling and the thought was there for us a year or two and I kept resisting it. And then it wasn't mm -hmm. until I met my friend, Jimmy, in January of 2020, right? Mm -hmm. It was like two or three days after my last time on my bike. Mm -hmm. And he, at the time, had been retired from the NFL about seven, eight or nine years, something like that. Um, I think he's like 10 years older than I am. So it was like perfect mm -hmm. example of someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I was like, hey, since you retired, have you played any, you know, pickup games, any flag football touch or anything like that? And he's like, no, mm -hmm. I mean, I've thrown the ball around, you know, but I haven't gone back to that level or even close to that level. Mm -hmm. And after my last competition, I was still riding at the same level, still training in the gym, mm -hmm. in the, on the ramps for like two or three years, just because mm -hmm. I didn't know what else to do. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. And when he, how simply he answered it, I was like, that's it. I keep getting met with resistance of starting this business. You know, at the time I was about uh, three years in, but I still didn't feel adequate. I didn't feel like I deserved mm -hmm. uh, the imposter syndrome was so, so severe. And I was like, mm -hmm. that's it. I need to. I need to take this away from me. And that's when I decided to walk away from BMX altogether as mm -hmm. an experiment. Two months later, the pandemic happened. All the parks started shutting down. I was like, okay, well, here's here's some, uh, I guess, uh, not a good sign, but a, a, a positive sign of the choice being right. Mm -hmm. And um, then, you know, a year, a year and a couple of months after that, I had the seizure. So it was, at first it was an experiment. And then as the year went on where I was like, let me take BMX away for a year. I haven't done that since I started riding my bike as a child. Mm -hmm. Let's see who I am without BMX attached to my name and without participating in it. So mm -hmm. it, it started as an experiment. And then along the way, I, it made sense that, oh, maybe that was my intuition telling me that it was time to move on and to prioritize mm -hmm. my health even more. Because even throughout my career, I was taking my nutrition serious, my mindset mm -hmm. serious, you know, mm -hmm. um, my, my workouts, I was meditating, all these things. Mm -hmm. but the risk was still there. And mm -hmm. so it started out as an experiment actually was my intuition leading me to uh, protecting myself because had I hit my head um, without knowing that I had that fifth tumor and where it was located, I may not be here speaking with you yeah. today or being able to live how I do today. So yeah, it was, it was like that, that transition was fighting that resistance until I spoke with Jimmy and how simply and quick he answered my question that it, it just snapped right there. And I was like, there's That's a cool. light bulb moment. Yeah. Let's, 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 let's experiment. <laughs> It's often the way, isn't it? I know when um, I decided to leave the health service, it you know it was it was following a conversation with a friend and saying, you know, why are you chasing? You know, I think I was chasing. Um, I was chasing what was I chasing position status definitely identity I really having worked as a nurse for 35 years I was sort of like you know this is who I am and then it's very interesting and interesting when we talk about the time frame because it, it was for me it was just before the pandemic as well that um you know what you go who are you when you mm -hmm. take away that thing that you did every day for many many years and you know and I'm, I don't think I'm there yet actually I think I'm still tied up with it a little bit um but finding different ways to to do that and it, and it's definitely a journey so I'm gonna ask you Josh who are you without BMX yeah I mean I'm a very kind and passionate and uh, driven person and I want to serve other people and those were the the attributes of uh, my Joshness I, I think we all have an essence to us I refer to as our yeah. ness um, yes. those attributes of being driven, of being passionate, of being a visionary, of being willing to do whatever it takes to make that vision a reality. That's what made me so successful in my BMX career. And those are the attributes mm -hmm. I learned um, I possessed. It wasn't what I did. I wasn't a BMX rider. I was me. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what I possessed is what allowed me to excel in that area of my life that I did love and I did enjoy. And I, I do miss it to a degree. But mm -hmm. I've learned to take those attributes and shift them to, like I said earlier, to on purpose of something beyond me, which is what I do today with my coaching and my speaking is I really want to help empower other people. I want them 
to be defined by their vision, not their circumstances. And that's what I found myself so many times was being defined as the BMX athlete. And although I chose not to be defined by the brain tumor circumstances and things like that, because mm -hmm. my vision was so strong, that vision evolved and that vision started to evolve without BMX. And I started mm -hmm. to get, I started to have this gap internally grow of my perception of myself uh, internally and then externally based upon how other people perceived me. Yeah. And so that challenge was there. But now today I'm very clear about those attributes I mentioned earlier. And I, I take all of that and I apply those same you know attributes to the work I do today to help, to help other people, not just myself. Yeah, I love that. I actually love that. That's really, really good. Now, you talk about auditing your life and, you know, the way I, I was so I do my prep for this and I was thinking, so what does he mean by that? And, you know, um, I know one of the things that I coach people is to literally audit the time they're spending doing stuff. And that is a revelation. It was a revelation to me. Um, but I, what I was intrigued by is sort of like optimize and leverage your fears. So, you talk about perspective being essential. So let's start with that. And, you know, so how did you come up with this topic? Um, you know, what does it mean to you? Tell me everything. Yeah. So I like the word, or I love the word audit and optimize or the words audit optimize. And for me, audit, it's just taking a deeper dive and a deeper look at, um, we're talking about our life audit. And like, that's when I started with the brain tumor diagnosis was like, let's look inward. What about me? Um, could have caused this? What about me could have prevented it that I wasn't doing? So um, the audit is really just, you know, taking a, a deep look at the different aspects of your life and asking yourself, you know, what do you want to be true about these areas of your life? And how are you being congruent or incongruent to what you say you want? And so with perspective, you know, something I learned was um, it's essential to life because it's, it's essentially the filter in which we see the world. And if we have the perspective that, you know, glass half empty versus glass, half, glass half full, it's like, well, if you believe that things are happening to you rather than for you, then you're going to be a victim to life. But if you believe that things are happening for you and there's a learning behind all those things, even though there's things you know, we know we don't control life, but if that perspective is there to see and to be curious of like, what's going on behind the scenes? What is this event or this experience here to teach me? And how can I leverage my pain, so to speak, to um, help me move forward in life? So really auditing our, ourselves inside and out and our external environment and all the things that we say we value and want and need in our lives and just really you know, ranking them. Like, where are we with those aspects and what can we do to better them? I learned very vividly by being forced you know, that I didn't prioritize my health. Mm -hmm. And when my health and my life were on the line, that quickly became a number one priority because I was so afraid of dying that mm -hmm. I wanted to do everything I could to have a chance at living. And so I needed to optimize my mindset, my nutrition and all those things. So my perspective shifted on, on food, what I was consuming, on my relationships, what type of relationships was I engaging with, how I was showing up in the world and how I was letting things affect me because you know, there's no denying reality but it's not about what happens to us it's about how we respond and how we let things affect mm -hmm. us. And so um, I live by this, uh, this saying that actually I got tattooed across my hand, C is greater than E. So being at cause is greater than being at effect to life. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if we're at cause to how we respond and our you know, experiences in life, then we can be empowered to do something about it. But every time we say it's not my fault, it's so-and-so's fault. It's that thing's fault. It's not me. It's that or them. We're being at effect to life. We're being a victim in our life. And that's to me, not a way to live. And um, so yeah, perspective, I think is essential because it really determines how you see yourself, how mm -hmm. you see the world. And then that builds unconscious belief structures that we live by. And then that influences how we behave in the world. And it's like um, that saying, doing the same thing over and over expecting a different result is the definition of insanity or something like that. It is. Yeah. It is. So yeah, it when is. you, when you shift the way, and there's another quote, when you shift the way you see the world, the world changes or something like that. And yeah. that's to me perspective, you know, you can, that's why we can have two people see the same event, but based on the autobiography of their life, their perspective is going to see, they're going to perceive that event in different ways. So that's why I think it's so important to consider your perspective and audit how you see the world, your, your belief structures, what, problems you have and what meanings you're making of those problems and then what do you want to do about changing them that's amazing I love that I love that 
So, and, and and particularly amazing is that some people could say having five brain tumors is a bit of bad luck, isn't it? And not your fault. And but that that's not the way you saw it. Or did you think that you caused the brain tumors or did you just, it, it, it is what it is. And then you move forward from that. Yeah, I mean, and to be clear, my response has evolved over, I mean, so 12 years now. When I first yeah. got diagnosed, I instantly was like, why me? What did I do to deserve mm -hmm. this? Am I a bad person? And then as I overcame it, the second diagnosis, there was a little bit of that, but then I was like, oh, perspective. I did this once, I can do it again. It's not a severe, mm -hmm. so we're good. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I started to learn more of how to better my health, how to better my mindset and take care of myself overall. And so when the third diagnosis came, it was just, I, it was, I was doing an ESPN article and they quoted me at this, when I um, called the guy that I was doing the interview with, and I told him about the news and I was like, I am just thinking, how can I leverage this to help me and help other people? So what is this mm -hmm. telling me? Yeah. So of course it started out as like being the victim and you know, why me, but then it evolved to like, how can I use this? And mm -hmm. so when people say like, oh, you're, you're lucky to be alive and it's like, well, I could be but I also made a choice to do something about my life to where maybe the second or third or the fourth diagnosis wouldn't have gone the way it did mm -hmm. if I didn't make those choices. So, um, and I also don't, don't think I'm a victim. I, that's the thing I, um, I see a lot of people, we, we identify with our circumstances. So we become the victim in our mm -hmm. lives. And I don't, I don't believe that, uh, I never believed um, since the first uh, diagnosis, but since I overcame the surgery, I don't have a belief that I am defined or held back or I live with a disability or anything like that, mm -hmm. but it doesn't serve me. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's just a choice. You know, I don't believe in absolutes, but I also don't believe that we need to believe in our circumstances and be defined by it because it's not serving me. Now, if that's what I wanted to do, then there's no right or wrong. There's no judgment on it. But personally, I want to live the life I want to, and I don't want to have um, my power being, you know, shared to other things that are out of my control and then being like, this is why I'm unhappy. This is why I'm unhealthy. It's, it's all directed inward, which I've gone to the other end of the extreme of that taking too much accountability where it's paralyzing. <laughs> There's a fine line there, but at the yeah. end of the day, it's like, I want to have all the accountability because I, if I believe I created this problem, then I have to also believe I can change and be the solution to the problem. Oh, I like that perspective. I do have actually, I like, I like that perspective. So there's a lot there. And uh, one of the things you talk about is health is, is, is eternal. And, but you also say, our re and you just alluded to, our reality is a manifestation of our choices, but that's unconscious. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned about, so two people can look at the same thing and because of their biology, their, what's, their, what's happened to them in their life, they can take that totally different. And I really like what you said, actually, about you've got a choice about how you deal with it and the accountability about, I guess, for me, it's about the accountability for what you're responsible for, isn't it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's it's just taking accountability <laughs> for me. what's going on in your life, not blaming or putting at fault to anything mm -hmm. or anyone, even yourself, but taking mm -hmm. accountability. There's a difference of blaming yourself or saying I'm the fault or I'm at fault for this, or it's their fault. Mm -hmm. Taking accountability is showing up and saying, you know, it's taking ownership over it. It's like, oh, in my case, I was like, what the lifestyle is living as a 17 to 21 year old was toxic. And I know that now. So that's yeah. when I was like, oh, let's audit. How was I living? What was my sleep like? What was my stress like? My nutrition? How much alcohol was I drinking at a young age? How yeah. much sugar was I consuming? That probably didn't help. If anything, it fueled what I was going through. So mm -hmm. it's just, I was doing that. No mm -hmm. one else was. So then I mm -hmm. can change that, which is what led me to making the changes in my health. And yeah. that's actually speaks to the health is internal aspect is because mm -hmm. for so long, I believe if I'm in shape, if I'm you know not overweight, if I look mm -hmm. healthy, then I am healthy. Yeah. I learned very quickly that having a six pack doesn't mean you're healthy because internally I had a brain tumor and it yeah. required hitting my head to get the MRI. So that's when yeah. I started learning about metabolic health and things we can actually test like simple things like our blood glucose, our A1C, and we mm -hmm. can check all of our, you know, different hormone regulations and C reactive mm -hmm. protein for look for inflammation, like all these things. And it's like, it took me going through what I went through to open up my perspective to, oh, there, there could be other ways to determining what health actually looks like and means and how mm -hmm. we go about, you know, measuring those. And what does health mean to you now? After everything health? that you have experienced, what is healthy to you? 
healthy to me is just, you know, how well my brain's working. If I'm, if I'm happy, if I'm feeling well, if I'm thinking well, it's not mm -hmm. about looks, it's not about physical performance. It starts with my brain mm -hmm. and we can track, you know, how well our brain's doing and yeah, uh, different things like that. So um, to me, health is, it's everything. It's, mm -hmm. it's how we show up. It's, it affects how we show up mentally, physically, spiritually, energetically, um, emotionally. It's, it's everything about us as a human being. If we don't have our health, we have nothing. That is so true. That is so true. Um, you've got some book recommendations related to this, haven't you? So could you tell me, um, tell me about them and why you chose them and what, and what they mean to you and how they've helped you? Yeah, yeah. So um, the first book about health that I ever read, nutrition-wise, anything, is called Grain Brain. And it's by yes. a, a neurologist named uh, Dr. David Perlmutter. Mm -hmm. And the book talks about the brain, of course, but it talks about how our choices in food and toxins and lifestyle, sleep and medication, all these things affect our blood sugar and our blood sugar regulation and how that directly correlates to the health, functionality, and longevity, and disease risk of our brain. And being a neurologist, um, you know, he's uh, very well versed in this area. And he actually got into his work by watching his father, who is a, a neurologist, go through Alzheimer's. And mm -hmm. so that's what got him passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And looking into, you know, what they're considering type three diabetes as Alzheimer's. It's a blood sugar dysregulation. They're, they're referring to it as insulin resistance in the brain. And what that does to creating all the plaques and all the different things that are, mm -hmm. you know, hallmark, uh, or hallmarkers of Alzheimer's. So mm -hmm. um, that got me really interested of how I could take um, note of different changes I can make and implement the changes to better regulate my blood sugar, which then helps my brain perform better. So that's, that's my favorite book to recommend to anyone trying to mm -hmm. better their health. Um, Cause it starts with the brain. And if we can learn about what goes on inside the body and how that impacts the brain. And then we learn from there, um, how the brain is the, you know, the operating system of who we are. It's a conductor of our, our bodies and it creates all these chemicals and these messages and all these things. Then if we can understand how we can, you know, improve or optimize our brain health and performance, the rest of us is going to show up better. And then that leads into the other book I mentioned in, in the notes to share today was how to do the work by Dr. Mm -hmm. Nicola Perra. Um, I don't remember if that one was actually on it, but that's the one that just came to mind because she's a psychologist. Yeah, it is, yeah. So um, yeah. she uses the lens of her story and her experiences to, to teach all these lessons that she learned as a, uh, um, a licensed uh, psychologist and talks mm -hmm. about how our unconscious mind and our central nervous system is really the conductor, which is all about our brain. And it's a conductor of our lives and how we show up, how it creates our personality types and how it creates these different chemicals that we call emotions, which is the feelings that we have, which is the language of the body, how all that influences how we show up in our days, which creates the reality that we experience. And that, that speaks to my third point that you mentioned of our reality is just a manifestation of our choices, but largely those choices are unconscious. And mm -hmm. that's due to how the central nervous system is triggered one way or another, which is built upon how we're conditioned in life from zero to seven and then seven to 25, 26, when our prefrontal cortex fully develops and we can yeah. think about what's going yeah. on and be able to critically yeah. think about things. So yeah, yeah. Th those two books have just changed my life and they're a great starting point, I think, for people that want to understand themselves, um, starting with the brain and their central nervous system and just how that affects their personality and what they can do about it, most importantly. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I love that. I, I'm, and uh, I haven't heard of um, those two books, um, but my son had, especially the grain brain one, he had heard of it. So um, I'm going to check those out. You also talk okay. about atomic habits, which is everybody, I, I have to be honest, I have it, but I haven't read it. So many so people talk. say that when I mention the book, they're like, oh, I, I, so many people told me to get it. I got it. I haven't read it yet. And I'm just like, oh, it's just, it's so brilliant. And I love James Clear and just the way he explains things. And he's a former athlete. So he uses the word optimize a lot. And I resonate with that. And um, he's very well versed in neuro linguistic programming, which is a big part of habit formation. And so Atomic Habits is another one of my favorites. I, I have five core favorite books I love recommending. These are three of them. But yeah. Atomic Habits, I think is so essential because it teaches you how habits are built unconsciously and uh -huh. how we can consciously repeat changes to rebuild a habit. And it takes on average 66 days for someone to create a new habit. Again, that's average. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he talks about, um, you know, he uses the golden circle that Simon Sinek used and made famous in, in my world, at least about mm -hmm. the, uh, the why and the core and the mm -hmm. middle layer, the how and the outer, the what. 
Mm -hmm. James uses it in a similar light, but about goal setting and habit formation to create goals um, or to realize goals and so on and so forth. And he uses a little different at at the core is our identity in the middle is systems and processes. So similar to the how, and then the outer layer is the outcomes or the what many of us, when we create a goal and we want to form habits to get that goal, we start with the outer layer, the outcomes, Mm -hmm. the what Mm -hmm. we want to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we all mostly think to go a little bit inward how do I make that happen? What, what systems do I need to have in place? What processes do I need to create? You know, all these strategies and this and that, but very few of us get to the core of our identity because our identity is wrapped up of our beliefs, our, our, our identity of like who we believe we are, what's possible, which influences how we show up and behave. And our identity is also reflected to us in our external environment. So yeah, it's cool to have goals. It's necessary to have goals, the outer layer, And then, yeah, it's necessary to have a plan, the middle layer, but most importantly, you have to audit who you are intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, energy wise, all the inner core, the identity and think about, am I showing up intellectually, um, emotionally, my behavior? So physically, all the, my actions, all my interactions with people, am I showing up in a way that's congruent to putting me on the path to have my outcome someday or not? And so the book mm-hmm. is a great way of understanding your current habits and how to change them to be in line or congruent with the outcomes that you want in your life. So those, those three, it's so profound because they're all talking about the brain on different levels and in different manners, but really how to optimize our efforts moving forward to the life that we want to experience and who we want to become. I absolutely love that, Josh, because you've explained it very well. And I have read lots of... Um explanations of atomic habits and that is the best one it makes the most the most sense so thank you so much for that that's amazing and that was amazing and I will give it a I will give it a go because I think it is it's so it and the reason that you have inspired me is because it is about identity and you can't you know and I know this from personal experience that some of the things that are holding you back are about the way you feel about yourself and you know and what's possible so I, I'm going to give that a go so thank you for that you've actually got one more which is um another book I actually have got and have got halfway through actually the go-giver oh yeah yeah talk to me yeah. about the go-giver the go-giver um yeah, it's, it's a, what is their phrase? It's a small story about a powerful business idea, I think is the phrase. And it, it brings you, and I don't want to spoil the book, but it brings you through the lens of a main character meeting five different people and the stories of what they, um, they do, how they got there and all these things. And the, the premise of the book is this main character has got the, this expert giving out his expert secrets. And he, he keeps going to him and asking him for advice. And the guy is just like, it's all about giving. And he brings you through these five different characters mm. you meet and the examples of what they do. And it's all about service. And yes. so the go-giver really helped me. Um, there's there's two phrases in there that stood out to me, um, two quotes or phrases, whatever, however you want to word it. Um, one of them that is just most profound to me was like, your net worth is determined by how much value you give rather than receive mm-hmm. and the lives you're able to impact with that value. And I'm paraphrasing, I forget how it exactly goes. I think it might be combining the both of them. So but it's something like that. It's all about the, the expert secrets is about giving. And mm-hmm. that's the go-giver way. It's like, you want to be successful. You have to give of yourself and not ask for anything in return or expect mm-hmm. anything in return. And the more you give, then the more you'll receive over time. But it's more about giving. And the, the guy, the, the main character couldn't understand it until he went through, met all five people that you'll, you'll meet when you read it. And um, so it just really got me to think differently about how I showed up in the world. And again, my perspective, I was in that, although I've been working on my mindset and all that stuff, you know, I'm still human. And I was locked into the scarcity mindset, this lack Mm -hmm. mindset. And Mm -hmm. I was, you know, unconsciously trying to seek out opportunity to gain. Mm -hmm. And then I reading that book, it was back in 2017. So five years ago now, and it just really helped me shift my perspective to like, okay, it's okay to have wants and needs and it's necessary. I'm a human being. I have a family, like all these things. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I can't make it about my needs and my wants. I need to make it about my work, about helping other people. And I was still transitioning into coaching and speaking. So that book was really pivotal for me in getting to that perspective that it's not about making money. That's not what I'm in the business of doing. I'm in the business of helping people change their lives. 
money is just an exchange of value and of energy and it's a resource it allows me to do more of what i want to do which is helping people largely you know i do have my own wants and desires and goals and you know things like that but mm-hmm. yeah the go-giver it's um there's a series of them so there's the go-giver yes. which is the original and there's the go-giver leader the go-giver salesman the go-giver influencer yeah. i'll look at my bookshelf um and it's all about the go-giver way you know and it's just about how much you can help people and impact them and then you'll see that value reciprocated over time. And it's not about making money. It's not about, it's just about how much you can give and help other people. That's amazing. I love that. So um, I've got a I've few, got a few of, of those. Um, my my, um, my uh, microphone went a bit funny there. Um, I've got a few of those. Um, so and I'm going to look at them as well. That'll be really brilliant. So um, I always ask that, but we've actually talked about this quite a lot already. I always ask my guests, how do they um, manage their own health and well-being? And how do they say focus, positive, productive? But you've told us. So I'm going to ask, a, I'm going to ask the question, but given that you were very fit, very healthy, apart from your diagnosis, and you've given it up now, you know, how do you stay healthy, fit now that you've given up the thing that you did for years and years and years? Yeah, I, I have a few non-negotiables set in place. Um, one of them is just how I eat. I, I, I enjoy how I eat today. Um, I'm not, um, it took me some time to get there, but I've learned a lot. And so one of my non-negotiables is my nutrition. Am I primarily fueling my body with things I know is going to be beneficial for me. And I, I live with a more severe condition, um, or I used to, I'm, you know, for, I got to change the language there, uh, which is another one. Uh, my non-negotiable is looking out for my language and my mindset. So um, yeah, I just, I really try to do my best to um, be considerate of the choices I make with my nutrition, uh, the choices I make in my speaking and my con- consumption of language, whether it be a book, it'd be music, it'd be movies, TV shows, conversations, relationships. Um, and regular movement, you know, I'm not in the gym five days a week, you know, for an hour and a half, two hours, like I was when I was competing. Um, I'm in the gym a couple of days a week for anywhere from an hour, uh, 45 minutes to an hour and a half, you know, it just looks different. I'm just, I'm having more grace with myself there, but I'm more, mm-hmm. I'm still disciplined. I still, you know, I'm active. And then, you know, with physical activity, I picked up golf, um, you know, to replace oh, wow. BMX. And so I really enjoy that. It gets me out moving for four or five hours out in the golf mm-hmm. course, out in the sun. Um, but the main non-negotiables is just being, you know, um, auditing consistently. How am I eating? How am I sleeping? How am I thinking? How am I speaking? What are my relationships like? Ultimately, how am I showing up and how can I better that? That's why I love reading books of psychology and psychiatry and nutrition and in business and communication and all these things. It's because my, my desire is to continue showing up as my best self and keep evolving and progressing because I know that's going to directly and indirectly impact other people. So um, yeah, those are just some of the non-negotiables and systems I have set in place to con- continue doing that and just continue auditing and striving to be the best version of myself and not judging myself and then judging others, which is when well, we're human beings, we're constantly doing that. Uh, thanks to our left brain, the interpreter of our lives, it can't help but label things and judge things, but it's not about making them good or bad. And it's catching ourselves. And when we, when we slip up and with ourselves or with other people and, Um, it's just, it's taken so many years of conscious repetition to form that habit of that's the person I am. I'm that person that continues to strive to be better and have more humility and have more empathy and curiosity and grace and love in the world and share that as well. That's wonderful. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that'd be very inspirational, um, to a lot of people. So, um, how do people, work with you find out about you get you to speak for them Um, i know you've got um, a little offer a little gift for our listeners tell us tell us how to get in contact with you and um yeah tell us everything yeah yeah so my my website is probably the best place the Mm one-stop shop um for all things me my podcast my coaching services my videos speaking all that it's just joshperrybmx.com and then, you know, I'm most uh, active on LinkedIn these days, um, mm-hmm. trying to trying to get better there. But all of my social media platforms, um, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, which is my least used, Facebook, LinkedIn, it's all just Josh Perry BMX. Um, yeah, so anyone that's interested in, in my life and my work and my speaking, um, all those things, uh, you can shoot me an email through uh, my website, shoot me a DM on Instagram or LinkedIn or, you know, 
comment on something, whatever. I, I try to do my best to be aware of whatever I can and respond. And um, yeah, as far as the uh, the free offer, it's just a 30 minute, um, what I call an audition call. Just uh, I like see, that. You know, yeah. <laughs> just see, I love that. <laughs> see if we vibe, you know, if we're good personality. And if so, yeah. we, we move on. I just, I gather a little bit of information of what's going on. I help the the person do a quick audit of what's going on and uh -huh. what's showing up for them and then i do my job to listen out for language i love linguistics so just helping people recognize what they're saying unconsciously and then you know moving on from there so it's just an opportunity to get to chat with me and just to see how i can help in any which way that's lovely thank you so much and all of that information will be in the show notes and also links to the books and to the free 30 minute chat with josh as well so josh this has been fantastic i really enjoyed our conversation it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and talk about how you see the world and your perspective on it and um i've loved um that you shared that with us and you know and with me and with the audience have you got um, an actionable takeaway that our listeners and viewers can take with them um, at, um, at when we when we go in a minute? Yeah, I, I think too, for me, um, I have it tattooed across my arms. It, it says fear is a thought and thoughts can be changed. And so you can see it right here. Yes, yes, I and can. Amazing. Thoughts can be changed. Yep. And I think something that can really be applied there is to just audit your thoughts, take some time of the day to just be with yourself, to be off your phone, away from screens of all kinds, away from people. Just take mm -hmm. two minutes, five minutes, whatever it is. Um, if you're brave enough, you know, go to a float tank. Um, I like float <laughs> therapy. It's, it's, you know, I'm by myself and it's just, there's no disruptions there, but it could be scary for someone to be by themselves with their thoughts. And I don't think enough of us take the time to do that, but that's where all the answers are. And so I think that if someone can understand that their, their, um, their fear is just um, being triggered by a thought, and they can change their thoughts, but it starts with getting clarity on what's going on in your mind and catching those thoughts and auditing. Do, are these thoughts serving me? Are they even mine? Did they get passed mm -hmm. down to me? Are they conditioned? Are they societal? Mm -hmm. Are they from a past experience? Because if you can do that, that's the first domino. It's just gaining perspective on how you think and how you feel and how that influences how you show up, which creates the reality you experience. And we're all constant works in progress. The work doesn't stop. That's why I love Dr. Nicole's book, How to Do the Work, because it, it, you learn how to do it and then you continue to do the work. And that's the beauty of it. The more you do it, the easier it gets and the more um, efficient it gets, but it's still, it's still there. We're human beings. We're always evolving. We're always triggered in different ways. As we do this and we uncover that, we also learn what else we didn't know. And we have to learn how to handle that and work through it. So I think you know, what could be most applicable from our conversation today is just take some time to consider what you have going on in your mind, whether that be just, you know, closing your eyes for a minute or two, or just be with your thoughts, journaling, talking with someone, talking to yourself and recording it and listening back to it, um, mm -hmm. asking yourself about different aspects of your life, different problems and what that means to you. And just, you know, take that audit and see what comes up. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Josh. Thanks for being our guest today. That's it for the Dawn Jarvis show today. It's a really good one today. I really enjoyed it. Um, let me know if you did too. Like, share, subscribe, and we will see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.